If you have your Bibles, turn with me to the second book of the New Testament. It's actually towards the last third of the Bible, to the book of Mark. We're going to be in chapter 12, verses 1 through 12. And as you're turning there, I'll tell you that if you are uh, a new Christian or if you have not given your life over to the Lord and like to learn more about Christ, there are a lot of people that have been uh, converted through reading the book of John. And certainly there's a video series out on the book of Matthew designed to tell the story. But uh, for years, I have relied upon the book of Mark. It's my favorite of the Gospels because I think it's the easiest to connect with. So if you're looking to learn about the story of Jesus in an action-packed way that, that really gets you through and gives you the story of Jesus, I'd encourage you to spend some time in the book of Mark. Well, we are talking about the parable of the tenants. But before we look at the story, I think it's important for us to kind of take a moment and see kind of the, the greater context uh, in, in which this story is told. In Mark chapter 11, just a chapter before, uh, we have the, the start of Jesus' final week on, on this earth as, as he's getting ready, his final week of, of his ministry. Uh, we know how that, that's going to end up on the cross. And so in, in Mark chapter 11, we have uh, Jesus returning to the capital city of Jerusalem. And it begins with in a fantastic mountaintop experience with the uh, entering into the capital city and the triumphal entry of, of Jesus. And he's riding on a colt, not a war horse, but a, a smaller colt who is, is designed to communicate, I'm here for peace. I, I'm here for reconciliation. And so as he's riding in, you have the people that are laying down the palm branches and, and are, are taking off their, their outer cloaks and, and kind of paving a way for for Jesus as he comes in and they're shouting Hosanna Hosanna blessed is the coming king of our father David and what they're saying is is happening the, the king that we've always wanted is here we believe he's the one to come and rescue us and save us not knowing really anything about what Jesus was true there to do hey but you have this this king that's coming in what's the first order of business well, it says he, he retires that evening and goes back out to Bethany, he probably the home of, of Mary and Martha, and he kind of regroups after the, the parade kind of uh, disperses and people go home. But the next morning, he comes in. He walks into the temple area. First order of business for this son of David. Mark chapter 11, verse 15. On reaching Jerusalem, Jesus entered the temple area and began driving out those who were buying and selling there. He overturned the tables of money changers and the benches of those selling doves. Well, this is a very serious matter. This is not just, well, I have an opinion about this and I'm going to kind of knock over a few things. No, he definitely got the attention of the temple authorities. And, and Jesus clearly occupied this temple area for the uh, next few hours. Mark chapter 11 and verse 16 says, He would not allow anyone to carry merchandise through the temple courts. It, it, it's just so hard for us to imagine that people have gathered there to worship, but yet you've got the, the sound of the animals that are happening and you have the, the changing of, of money and, and the commerce that's going on. Lost people just walking through. So you've got people there, they're, they're trying to worship, they're trying to connect with God and, and trying to do all these things. But yeah, it's just chaos, it's this circus, it's this zoo. And Jesus says, enough. I'm not going to allow this to happen. And Jesus and his disciples blocked this unauthorized bypass, this hallway that they made through the temple. And he starts overturning the tables and the money changers. He grabs the chairs of, of those that, that are sitting there, that, that are selling the doves and other animals, and he starts chunking them. And you, you, get, you get visions uh, of different people over time that have just gone nuts that we, we see. You think of, uh, you know, the great college coach, Bobby, that, that grabs his chair and chunks it out on the court and says, enough, I'm not going to stand this for any more. And how the whole audience must have just been aghast to watch this. And so he shuts down the whole 35-acre complex, not just driving out those that were there to sell, also those that were buyers. He says, enough of this. I'm not going to stand. So... Everyone has been put on notice. It's no longer going to be business as usual. N.T. Wright suggests this. 
that it's more than just what was happening in there in the temple. N.T. Wright says, we're getting ready to totally destroy everything. The new messianic king had claimed his own and had signaled the obsolescence and the destruction of this temple. We're not going to allow this to stand. A new kingdom has been ushered in. And this whole thing that you guys have gotten comfortable with, and some of you have made a, a pretty penny on, no more. It is over. And so those that were in charge, it says the chief priests and teachers of law, decided then and there with, with this confrontation, Jesus has to die. It, it's not going to happen now. He's way too popular. Can't happen out here in the, because people are agreeing with him. Yeah, this is wrong. And, the, and they're, they're, he has this massive following. So they can't do it. But they start privately plotting. We've got to end this. We're not going to allow him. It's either going to be him or us. And Jesus is saying that as well. And so they begin asking him, by what authority do you do these things? How, how can you come in here and just take over the temple and start knocking things down? Who are you to do these things? Well, after an, an evasive response, he tells them a story, a story that would answer their question indirectly. Mark chapter 12 and verse 1. He began to speak to them in parables. A man planted a vineyard. He put a wall around it and dug a, a pit for the wine press and built a watchtower. Then he rented the vineyard to some farmers and went away on a journey. At harvest time, he sent a servant to the tenants to collect from them some of the fruit from the vineyard. But they seized him and beat him, sent him away empty-handed. Then he sent another servant to them. There must have been some type of mistake here. That struck this man on the head and treated him shamefully. Well, there, there must be some personality conflict, or I'll, I'll send another. So he sent still another, and that one they killed. He sent many others, some of them... They beat, others they killed. He had one left to send, a son whom he loved. He sent him last of all, saying, They will respect my son. But the tents come to one another. This is the heir. Come, let's kill him, and the inheritance will be ours. So they took him and killed him, threw him out of the vineyard. What then will the owner of the vineyard do? He will come and kill the tenants and give the vineyard to others. Haven't you read the scripture? The, the stone that the builders rejected has become the capstone. The Lord has done that and is marvelous in our eyes. Then they looked for a way to arrest him because they knew he had spoken in parable against them. They were afraid of the crowd, so they left him and went away. Well, there aren't very many parables in the Old Testament. There, there's plenty in the, in the story of Jesus. But the, the passage that Russell read earlier from Isaiah chapter 5 is definitely one of the parables. And, and the audience that was listening there would know that he's kind of taking this parable that, that was given long ago and he, he's reshaping it. And he's crafting a new message for the audience. He's kind of updating an, an old favorite in, in order to, to hit the context of what's happening there. Well, what would be the message? Well, what's he trying to engender with his audience? What, what's he trying to get them to take away? Well, I, I think that there's, there's five main parts to his parable. And, and the first is that the vineyard was crafted and was put together, but was never in, intended for, for the owner to actually do this. He, he designed it for tenants to come in and to manage things. So it's rented, and then, well, at harvest time, he sent servants. Well, how were the servants treated? Well, it says that they were taken, they were beaten, and some killed. Well, what's the, the next act of the story? Well, that is, the owner sends his beloved son. Well, you guys know how, how that turned out. The next, the last scene, well, the son is seen and identified for who he is, and then he's murdered. And finally, the owner has to do something about that. And the final thing is the vineyard is rented to others. So that becomes our story. And so if, if we look at this and kind of look at it in a linear fashion, and we, we like this, going left to right, kind of reading across, and this happens and this happens and this happens. Well, 
Who is the story about? Well, if we look at it this way, the, the final crescendo, the, the climax happens right here. And that, man, the, the, the son is killed. And, and because of that act that happens right here, well, the vineyard gets taken away. And so who is the common person in both of these scenes? Well, that must be who the passage is about, the story is about. And if you're unclear as to who the passage is about, this parable is all about, well, look, look in your Bibles. Look, look at the, the, the kind of subject heading above this parable. Because if you look at it, in the NIV, it's the tenants. That's who the story is about. If you have the New King James, it's the wicked vine dressers. New Living Translation, it should say evil farmers. That's who it's about. That's who this, and, and so if, if that becomes the, the star of the show, the main point of this parable is you have the wicked religious leaders of the Jews that are getting their comeuppance. Finally, they're getting their just desserts. And so this is what's happening when you have this whole system that's beginning to collapse around them. Well, if you're here last week, we talked about another parable involving a vineyard where Jesus employed kind of this thousand-year-old way of telling stories. It's called a ring composition template in which the first stanza kind of relates to the last stanza and the next one to the next to last. And so if you look at this, then what happens in the middle becomes the thing that story is actually built upon. That becomes the climax. So let's look at that and kind of tear the story up that way. So the first one of these is that the vineyard is put together and it's rented out. Who is the person that puts the vineyard together? Well, that's actually God. God's the one that is the creator God that has done everything. And so God is the one that crafts the idea for this and puts this plan in motion. Who's the vineyard? Well, back in Isaiah chapter 5 and here, the people would have would definitely be able to tell, well, that's Israel. We are the one that he's put all this in place for. We're God's chosen people. And so you have this hedge. Well, what's the hedge? Well, it was mentioned in one of these passages. The hedge is this protection that, that goes around God's chosen people. So God's put that in place. We also have the tower that's mentioned here. And the tower and somewhat the hedge as well could represent the, the law of Moses that, that kind of serves as a central feature of God's people and kind of keeps watch over them that if they'll follow the law that was given, this covenant relationship given at Sinai, boy, that, that's going to help us. And the wine press, well, that could represent the Jewish ceremonial worship. And, and, and some say that, that that was the altar where it all came together. So this has been put in place and it's been turned over to the farmers. Who are the farmers? Those tending the vineyard, that would be the Jewish religious establishment that are guiding the people. And so the owner says, he goes off into a far country and kind of turns this over. So this would represent the, the time that, that God's people are, have been given a, authority to go and, and to interact according to the law in between the time of the prophets. This is what's happening. Well, there are times God has to send in his servants to go and check on the people and check on what's happening, the fruit of how they're living. And so the servants are sent, but they're not welcome like they should have been. No, it says that the servants are sent and are beaten. Who could this be? We've studied in our Old Testament that Jeremiah was definitely mistreated and along with many of the other prophets that were beaten and he was thrown into a well, and then you have fellows like Isaiah and, and others that, that, that were killed. And so you have Zechariah and John the Baptist had to be on his mind as recently that he is a person bringing forth the message of God to come and repent, but yet he's recently been beheaded. So all these things are happening at this time. But here's where the story gets interesting. We kind of understand this, that the vineyard's been put together, and They've rejected the whole notion that they're going to pay their portion back into the owner of the vineyard. But that puts the ball into the court of the, the owner of the vineyard. How is he going to handle the situation? Obviously, things have gotten escalated. 
And so he has to make some decisions here. The owner has the right to contact authorities. And the authorities would, would send some heavily armed company into the vineyard to drive out and, and to, to uh, prosecute those that have, have committed this atrocity, to storm the vineyard, to arrest the violent men, and bring them to justice. And the abusing of the servants had to have been an insult to the owner of the vineyard. You know, and indeed in his culture, he was honor-bound to deal with the matter. And being a man of means, he didn't have to turn over to the authorities. Don't you think he could have mustered up his own special forces unit? And we have the, the story where the four kings that sacked the city of Sodom. And not only did they go in and, and plunder Sodom and Gomorrah, but they also took some prisoners of war with them, including Lot, Abraham's nephew. And word gets back to Abraham of what's happened to his nephew. And the text tells us that Abraham got 318 of trained men in, in his household together and says, boys, it's time to strap on the swords. Let's go. We're going to take care of this ourselves. And they did and got Lot and his family back. Certainly, though, the owner of the vineyard, couldn't he have done this? Yes. The owner of the vineyard had to have been furious when he got word that the last group had been killed. Not, not just that they lost their lives, but they lost their lives carrying out his business. And the question is, what's he going to do with that anger? It, it's there. It's, it's bottled up into it. And it, it's generated by this injustice that his servants have suffered and his hand is, is calling. Will he allow his enemies to dictate his response? This is something that's very difficult for us to understand. That when people mistreat us or do different things, there, there's almost like society has filled in the blank as to how we're supposed to respond to that. If, if, if someone's not respecting you, you do something to make them respect you. That's what's going on on the street out here. So the owner has to decide, is this how I'm going to live? Do they get to fill in the blanks as to what my next move is? Because retaliation is possible in a lot of ways, in a lot of circles, it's expected. But is that the answer? In Luke's telling of this parable, the story, there's kind of a painful pause there where this owner of the vineyard is kind of contemplating. He's thinking about what he's supposed to do. And what he says here is, what can I do? Because I, I, know, I know what the world would tell me to do. What can I do? And in an incredible twist of the story, the owner reprocesses his anger and turns it into grace. And he declares, I'm going to send my son. So this becomes the purpose of this parable. This becomes the highlight of the story. The owner sends his beloved son. So we have to ask ourselves, why would he do this, and what does that tell us about the owner of the vineyard? You know, it is not only shocking that he sends his only son, but the text tells us he sends him in kind of unarmed and without escort. He just sends him in to this very difficult situation. We think of the story of Esau when he goes to meet with his brother years later. And this is their, their confrontation. Well, Esau is not going to come alone. He doesn't know if, if his brother has an out for him. And, and, and definitely Jacob is worried, worried sick about meeting his brother. Especially when he sees his brother's escort of 400 men. If you're going to send the son, you better send 400 of his buddies with him. And, and it kind of like when, when the royalty over in England ha have a princess in the army and they put him way in the back and they have a lot of other people that actually doing the fighting. This time he sends a son. He sends him alone. He arrives at the vineyard to meet the vicious men who had to be tensely gearing up, waiting for the owner's response. So they definitely have their swords ready and they have someone in the watchtower not looking over the grace, but looking over for this measured response coming from the owner. And instead of seeing a huge cloud of dust being kicked up by this army, it's one man walking along. He comes in unarmed, and he says, I want to talk. 
why did the Father send him like this? Ken Bailey shares a story of late, of the late Hussein bin Talal, the king of Jordan. And one night in the early 80s, the king was informed by his security detail that there were 75 officers from his army that were meeting over in the barracks that were plotting his demise. They were plotting the overthrow of the government there in Jordan. And those, so the security officers, officers met with the king and they said, this is what's going on. Do we have permission to go and surround the barracks and bring these guys to justice, throw them in, in and we'll put them on trial and they'll get what they deserve for their treason? The king says, no, you did not have my permission. Instead, bring me a small helicopter. So a helicopter was brought and the king climbed in without escort, went just with the pilot, and ask him to fly him over to the barracks, and the pilot land on a flat roof just down the street from where this meeting was taking place. He told the, the pilot before he left, he says, if you hear gunshots, fly away without me. So unarmed, the king of Jordan walked down the flight of steps, walked through the door of those barracks, and appeared in the room where these, meet, where these plotters were meeting, and quietly said to them, gentlemen, it's come to my attention that you're meeting here tonight to finalize your plans to overthrow the government, take over the country, and install a military dictator. If you do this, the army will break apart, and the country is going to be plunged into a civil war. Tens of thousands of our countrymen and innocent people will die. There's no need for this. Here I am. Kill me and proceed. That way, only one man has to die. After a moment of stunned silence, the rebels, as one, rallied and rushed towards their king, and they began to kiss his hands and his feet and pledge their loyalty to him for life. You know, just like King is saying, the owner is acting out of unspeakable nobility. He cares for these men. He cares for those that he's left in, in charge of the vineyard. He profoundly hopes that if he, if he could send his son to show how much it, it means to him to reconcile this relationship, this, re this relationship that's on the verge of collapse, I, I have sent my best servants to you, and now, now I send my one and only son so I can show you how much I'm trying to reach out to you and to reconcile this relationship with these tenants. You know, while it may seem a bit far-fetched, to have an earthly owner that would be willing to do this. This is exactly what God does. This is what he does for his people. This is the heart of our heavenly father that reaches out to them. This is his mission. He sends him on a very dangerous adventure. We know how it turns out. The son is seen. The son is murdered. What makes this story incredible that the owner, the owner of the vineyard knew that this was going to take place and he sent his son anyway. That's the kind of God we serve and that's the sacrifice that we celebrate each and every Sunday when we come together on the Lord's Day to celebrate in our time of community. John 3.16 says, For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son and that whoever believes in him shall not perish, but have eternal life. What can take a dying man and raise him up to life again? What can heal a wounded soul? What can make us white as snow? What can fill the emptiness? What can end our brokenness?
pray together. Lord, there is power in this story, and there's power in the cross. It's such an incredible parable spoken by your son, Jesus. Lord, forgive us when we resign that this was a message intended solely for the religious leaders of that day. Lord, it's a message for us as well. Father, help us to realize that we are the evil farmers, that you sent your beloved Son on our behalf in the midst of our rebellion. Not, not because we were good, because you alone are good. Lord, as we partake of this bread, help us to remember the sending of Jesus to us in the flesh. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. continue our prayer. Lord, as we continue this time of communion with you and with one another, Lord, as we partake of this fruit of the vine, may we be mindful of the blood of your beloved that was shed on our behalf at Calvary. Lord, we did not deserve this sacrifice, but Lord, we need this sacrifice. May it define us as a people. In Christ's name we pray. Amen.
restores our faith in God. What reveals the Father's love? What can lead the wayward home? What can melt a heart of stone? What can free the guilty ones? What can save and overcome? Overcome. Mighty, awesome, wonderful is the Holy Cross. It's still a mystery. And it's still a mystery. It's a miracle to me. The power of God for those who believe. Mighty, awesome, wonderful. The crescendo of Mark's gospel happens at the foot of the cross when the centurion comes and, and sees how Jesus dies and declares, surely this man was the son of God. You know that religious leaders made the decision that they were going to put him on the cross. But the decision still had to be made. Once you figure out who Jesus was, you have to decide how you're going to live going forward and it, it is not that well we put him on the cross so we're done no but because on the cross he said father forgive them for their sins they they don't know what they're doing so forgiveness is available and for some they made the the switch nicodemus saul and others made a decision i i'm going to turn from my ways and i'm going to follow this man and his teachings but for the majority they simply couldn't release their control. So the vineyard was rented to others. The finality of God's solicitation of Israel is in this. Jesus Christ, the beloved Son, was the final revelation of God to humanity. It's, it's, it's the final act of the story. It's, it's been building all throughout the history. And we've tried to point out in this cover-to-cover -cover series, God's plan all along. He was there from the beginning of creation. His son. All this has been culminating, getting ready for this event. So we've got to make a decision. The final act is that Jesus has been set. And so we have to figure out, how are we going to respond to that? The Jewish leaders of the day were unwilling to believe. And so the vineyard was rented to others. Well, what's the message for us? Now, the first thing is, we are loved and forgiven. I, I think that this parable exposes God's willingness to give himself and, and to give up his son a total vulnerability. He's laying it out there saying, I'm going to do everything I can by sending my one and only, my beloved. He's there. There's no way you can question my heart. There's no way you can question my desire to have you back with me. There's no way you, you can question my love. I've given everything to you. Now the decision is yours. 
The ball gets put back into your court. So we have to respond to that and, and truly under, uh, just understand exactly what it means because it does change everything. And so we have to live our lives in response to the un, unexpected and uncompromising love and the unmerited grace that's given. This story is not about how we messed up. And it's not about anything. The story is about what God did. We deserved it the least. But the second thing that we need to get from this parable is that we are renters, not owners. I know when, when Jill and I first got married, the, we, we wanted to be done with renting. And we call it you know, pouring money down the, the drain being renters. We saved and saved our first year because we wanted ownership not just ownership in a home. We want ownership in the American dream. We want to be controlling our own destiny, not being uh, held to, to any landlord that's watching over us. We want our own control. And that's exactly what's going on in this parable. There's a law in the Mishnah rega regarding squatters' rights that basically says if you occupy and maintain a property for three years, you take ownership of it. So what they're trying to do is run out the clock on, on, on this vendor donor that's far away. You know, they can keep killing those that have been sent. And, and finally take out the air. And the vineyard is ours. And we're set for life. We're no longer going to be migrant farmers. They're at the mercy of anyone else. We control our own destiny. As this becomes what they're trying to do. And after giving them every chance to turn back to him, the landowner eventually has to replace the tenants. If you go to Jerusalem and walk around and, and take the, the tour, it, it's really incredible knowing that you're in the, the very place where Jesus' and disciples were. But there's something that is troubling when you go and you, you see some of the stones that remain from Herod's temple back then, the, the ruins of the once great city. Because what, what this indicates is it, it's ushering in the arrival of the new kingdom, which is good, but it also ushers in the doom of the temple and those that refuse to accept the kingdom. And that still goes on today with, with people that have been almost pers persuaded. They're, they're presented with the gospel message of what God has done and said, well, I'm close, but it's more important to me than I own my own vineyard, that I control what happens behind these hedges, that, that, that I really have my ownership and my life is mine instead of turning it over to the gracious owner that will provide for us. You know, God has gifted each of us with talents and gifts and treasures. But there's an expectation that we will use those to honor Him and to advance the kingdom. That, that's what it's about. We really have to understand that we were made for Yahweh's will not to sprinkle a little Yahweh and, and God into our little kingdom. That's not what it's about. And we rebel against Christ, not because we misunderstand what's here in, in the text. We rebel against Christ because we know what's in there. We know the cost of discipleship. He says, I want you to lay down everything. I, I, I want your children to understand that compared to Christ, I, I no longer love you like I do Christ. I want you to understand that you may have a home, but you're like me. This is not the place you lay your head. You're looking for a new kingdom. You've not arrived. Hebrews chapter 11 is talking about those that have eyes for the far kingdom, and that's what he's calling us to embrace. That's what he's calling us to say, this is not our vineyard. We rebel against Christ when we say it's just too much. We have to keep singing that song. This world is not our own. We're just passing through. When we start seeing life in that way, it gets a whole lot easier for us to return to the owner. Just say, you provided all this. I'm just here as a servant of yours. Here's the fruit of my life. And I want to give everything I can to that kingdom. You know, you get to thinking, and I think as you get older, you start processing that our time on this earth is really so brief. May we make the most of it. May we be about our Father's business. Amen. Thank you, Brad. And thank the Lord this morning. God is good, isn't he? God's good, isn't he?